Chapter One of the Ninth Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Tricia G. The Ninth Man: A Story by Mary Heaton Vorse. Chapter One. It might have been said of us that our city was the iron pot, we in it the broth, and the edict of Ehidio Mazaleone the stick with which to stir the broth. It was a fine, big stick with a point at the end of it, as we found out, though at first sight it had a harmless look beside the naked sword, which was what we had expected. As the stick stirred, and the broth boiled and bubbled over the blue fire of his insolence, many a strange thing was cast to the top, things good and things bad, that none had guessed were simmering and cooking at the bottom of the broth, flavoring the whole of it. I shall go on to tell you the story of the wry faces that the town of San Moglio made as it cooked slowly over the insolence of a Hidio Mazzaleone. I have found out that it is always so in this world. You may call any handful, if you will, a city, for among them you will have in little the picture of the state. They love and die, bear children, buy and sell, and strive for power, and the days will go by one like the other, and you may think that you know each of your fellows as a book. Then singe them with the fire of a great event, and behold, your town will turn on you an unaccustomed and terrifying face. Myself, I cannot even now distinguish the events as they came, they happened so quickly, one on top of the other, like a dog tumbling downstairs. Whether it was his head or his tail that went first, you would be at a loss to tell. We were in sore straits in the city, I know that. There was wildcat fighting, there was a surrender to a greater might of mind and body than we could show, this I know too. Then there was peace. We wondered that we were not burned and pillaged like the cities that had fallen before us. Before he had entered the gate we had made a shrewd fight of it, but he had more of everything than we. Any outsider could have foretold the end. He had more men, and though it may not be becoming of a soldier to say it, a clerk like myself may perhaps be permitted to tell the truth. He had the greater genius for fighting. Not more bravery, mind you, but as much, I grant you that. And more, he had a brain in that misshapen head of his. After our defeat came the edict. What it meant I did not know, except that it was respite from death. And I had not drawn long breaths enough that I myself was safe, as well as the persons of those I loved, when my young mistress came to me. They say that I and all of the house are to appear in the public square and walk in person past Ehidio Mazzaleone. She frowned at me as though I had done this thing. Lady, I made haste to reply, I know not. She pressed her lips together, as if she would have spoken angrily to me, but she did not, and went to the window. See, she said, looking at the crowd in the street that wandered aimlessly up and down, on their faces the frozen look of those who stare death in the face. It seemed to me that they had the desolation of driven sheep who smell the slaughter pen and know the meaning of the smoking, sick, red smell of it. Among them all there were those who walked insolently as though to dare death, but there were none who remained unconscious of his shadow. As my lady bade me look, I saw one who walked outside the circle of this walking fear, like a happy child in a field of lilies. This young man belonged, it seemed by his habit, to some religious order. To us at the window above this restless moving people, driven hither and thither in their cold suspense, he seemed like a dweller from some other world who walked outside the circle of our concern. He had a rough-hewn and clownish face, and his eyes had the gentle and brutish gaze of the lads who tend goats on the mountain, but the high serenity that had made him solitary in a crowd shone from them. "'Bring him to me,' said my lady, "'for I will learn the truth from him.' I gained him with difficulty through the shifting throngs, 
and without surprise he followed me, so unquestioningly that I thought him little better than a poor witless fellow, until I saw him greet my lady, and the look he poured on her was as kind as water on a parched flower. "'What is the news?' my lady asked. "'Are we to walk before Mazzaleone like sheep? Is it true?' so it is commanded by mazzaleone said he and his voice sounded like a deep bell and i saw that this thing of so great importance to us and so great a hurt to our pride was less than nothing to this strange man who are you my lady asked him the least of all things the youngest of the brothers minor he answered we had heard of these lay preachers from assisi for their fame had spread greatly in those days do you preach in san moglio i am not worthy i cannot speak but as i go to and fro i talk to children about my master said he humbly i wait with hope and dread when my hour to speak shall come and the coal of speech shall be laid on my lips my lady considered his words and asked him questions concerning brother francis and as he answered her, we were so delivered from our shame and apprehension that it was only as he went away that my lady asked again, When shall this conquered and unhappy town walk past its conqueror? In three days, he answered. And as he went, my lord Count Bartolomeo Conti came clanking in, and the brother minor greeted him as he had my lady, to which my lord made no answer at all. And when the brother minor was gone, what did hear this lout asks he that is brother agnello he was here at my request my lady made answer in her softest tone of most level insolence and she turned and watched the brother minor as he wandered aimless and unafraid through the shifting panic end of chapter one Two of the Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. For three days he let us stew under the mask of clemency and of giving us time to learn the edict for which disobedience was the pain of death. Mazzaleone let suspense have its way with us. His heralds cried the edict out through the town. Through each little street went the command that on the third day that being a Friday, all of us, noble and simple, men and women, young and old, should walk before the loggia. And for this no explanation was given. The bare command, stripped down to its bone and nothing more, was the edict of Egidio Mazzaleone, and it seemed to us that it was as menacing and as lean as himself. Behind it we felt that terror was lurking some said he would butcher us one by one others said that our leaders and great men only would be slaughtered before our eyes and again there were those with higher imaginations who hinted at torture and burnings that it meant no good to us none of us doubted meantime not a house was thrown down nor occupied by the soldiers of mazzaleone all was left as it was found the men-at-arms were as stern and yet as even as Mazzaleone himself, but there they were, the iron witnesses of our defeat, we who three times had been taken and three times had shaken off the yoke of Pisa, free men, and had more than once entered, victorious, through the gates of other cities, not counting the fortresses, the castelli, and entrenched strongholds, fiefs of the empire that we had made our own, one after another, forcing their nobles to become citizens of our own commune. Now, while Mazzaleone's men patrolled us, we went about our business. The pothouses were overrun, and there was much quiet talking among the nobles. And, although we came and went unmolested, the people were not allowed to congregate in the streets or the piazza. He kept moving those who would stop to prattle, did a hideo Mazzaleone, and while we moved about, we pondered upon the meaning of his edict, until the height of each one of us felt an uncomfortable itching, as though it already felt the prick of the sharpened sword. The third day we had ceased to prattle so much, 
each man stayed more at home the women wept and the men sat with their heads in their hands a cold sort of fear plucked at the entrails of us for it is one thing to go to your death smoking hot your sword in your hand and by chance have another man's sword thrust into you before you can at him and another to march forth in the cold morning to have your throat slit in the morning of the day we started forth early i and a few of the other young scribes of the city had been sent for by mazaleone and stood in the loggia to count the townsmen and tell their names for what purpose i did not then know it was a strange procession that came before our eyes as odd a procession as ever any town witnessed for there were our chief men and our nobles with their heads up there were their ladies and there were the poor of the town here a man who had missed a right hand for theft and there an old woman hobbling on crutches and children were there as i looked i saw that spread like a morning veil over the crowd were those dressed in black and i saw that it was our nobles who had been moved to do this mazaleone sat in the loggia his captains about him and he saw it and smiled this spectacle i heard him say is more diverting and instructive than i thought and the captain behind him to whom he spoke answered small honor it seems to have taken such a town indeed as one looked down upon it it seemed that there were more old hags and women and children and pottering old men than aught else very different indeed from the time when all such were within doors and our burghers and stout men-at-arms were out with their clanking swords by their sides so san moglio walked along three abreast through a solid line of mazaleone's men in the beginning as they came close i was told to count upon the ninth and as the ninth came small black ballots were given them which they were told to keep all came docilely pride made them come so in the case of our black-robed nobles cold fear some of our burghers only old count dervesa de verti came protesting it was he whom it had taken the commune three years to smoke out of his perch in santa croce and during that time he sold his right in his castello for four thousand florins and later signed papers which were in my master's possession and which i saw with my own eyes promising that he would not in any wise help his faithful vassals who fought for him three long years while he had sold and resold them when no sign was left of santa croce and his vassals came to live in the commonwealth always he gave himself great airs at the resistance which he solitary had made against the town with the bombast of his race he refused to go forth in the morning whereupon the men of his own household trussed him up like an old turkey and brought him up squealing and gobbling he and a young count guido mazafini were all that made a disturbance that day and for guido it was a greater tragedy he was a boy of sixteen and his two brothers and his father had been killed in the fray and when they led him forth he made resistance and blubbered with rage and fought with the guards that held him at the noise of him mazaleone lifted his hand and said in his low voice that had the sound of a flicker of flame in it always stop the noise for me so they cut his throat and the blood spouted up like that of a stuck pig and they threw his body aside in the gutter at that though the house of mazafini was not beloved in the city a murmur went through the crowd the growl of a checked tiger and at the same moment the short swords of mazaleone's men leaped forth from the scabbards and i could see them shining like the white hills above san moglio when the sunlight strikes them at the glancing forth of the light of steel the murmur of our people died like distant thunder all was tranquil again and the march went on as before three by three and each ninth man got his sinister ballad of black ebony then the heralds in the loggia gave tongue thus saith the most clement of conquerors mazaleone san moglio shall go free for thirty days time while he takes his much-needed rest among those who so warmly received him thirty days past 
he will depart and take no other toll of blood than this each ninth man shall designate secretly whom he wishes put to death in the public place thus shall san moglio judge san moglio there was silence the simple and noble of the town stood as though death had struck them all the heralds cried again and again cried into the silence of our amazement then again and still we moved not we spoke not but a sigh swept us like wind in the olives and there was no sound but the heralds accompanied by men-at-arms making their way out to the four quarters of san moglio then suddenly a grey-haired hag who to see better had climbed the wrought iron fountain near the loggia raised her lean arms above her head and laughed and laughed and still laughed revenge was in her laugh and relief and she waved her clenched fists in air and laughed her hideous relief and her hideous revenge and then a very pandemonium of joy broke from that silent crowd strangers embraced the spell of fear was broken so they shouted and howled together except certain of our greatest who slunk away ashamed while in their hearts they echoed the words i heard mazzaleone speak gently to one of his captains the love of life ugolino is a foul thing end of chapter two three of the ninth man by mary heaton vorse this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three as i would have gone my duties being over and my lists given to the captain I heard the voice of Mazzaleone, as though he spoke low in my ear, yet he was many paces behind me, say, Stay, boy. And I wheeled as though the voice of him had been a power that turned me on my heels. And I hope I looked at him squarely enough, while he told me I was to go forth into the city and bring him back news of what I saw. Be eyes for me, said he. He sighed deeply, as though a great weakness were upon him, and I, with a fear in my heart, turned and left him, to do as he bade me. Fear, because I now saw the game of cat and mouse which he was playing with us. I had heard of other conquerors possessing a town, but he possessed us, it seemed to me, as no conqueror had possessed any. Though I had but a shadow of the subtlety of his imagination, I hated him that he should sit there and watch us through the narrow, bright slits of his eyes, and rest his long, tired length with the spectacle of us. Yet as I went from him, love struggled with hate in my heart, and both of them were subject to admiration. And when later his page-boy, Carlo, killed himself because of more than a passing displeasure of Mazzaleone, I did not wonder for the least sight of him stirred thus powerfully the hearts of those who came near him in one way or another as he had stirred the town of san moglio even as he possessed the town so he possessed me i became a part of him his eyes that is why certain scenes are burned into me as by fire there are times yet when i see in my sleep the narrow uphill streets of san moglio red and black with the flames and smoke of torches the town rushing through a hungry flood in pursuit of hot and smoking life after its cold fear of death i was young i thought of and had loved san moglio as i might love a fair and warlike and austere woman and i had found that the soul of san moglio was like the lean hag who lusted for life and for revenge even from the grave bands of men and boys and women too went through the streets terrible and revolting in their rejoicings the business of living and dying and of buying and selling for a moment sank into unimportance we are to live san moglio shouted therefore let us live and they lived at their hardest the savage rejoicing of the piazza would not spend itself and finally it was the sight of three fat women teetering and shrieking, crying and dancing, as though they were girls around a maypole, that sickened me. I went out up to the little piazza of Ogni Santi, and there, sat by the fountain, 
a man whose head was bowed on his hands, and as I came nearer I saw that it was the brother minor, Agnello, and I saw that he wept. And as he wept, he cried aloud, The Lord take from me this cup. Two loudish boys were throwing mud at him, but he heeded them not, and they, still tormenting him, cried, Why do you weep? said he, his hands in his eyes, because I have but thirty days to live innocent, and then, by taking an innocent life, I give my innocence. And he wept again, and the boys laughed harder, and one cried, Kill yourself, then. Then they ran off after their sheep, crying, Kill yourself. At this he dropped his hands from his eyes, and, kneeling upright, he raised his face up to heaven, and gave thanks to God that from the mouths of children he had been taught how to avoid the sin of taking the life of another. So I stayed there for a time, and went back into the town as though refreshed with water. Though he had not seen me nor spoken to me, I was glad to have come near him in his simplicity, for San Moglio was keeping step to some mighty and inaudible music, as a city will when it becomes a mob. The very children ceased their play and ran through its streets, small shrieking furies, more terrible than the wantoning girls, their grace and their youth, and that they knew not why they ran, marking the depth of us. It seemed to me that in all this great city, but for my lady, I saw not one familiar face. Can the whole heart and soul of a town be like a changeling? or had San Moglio worn a mask, I wondered, or under the torture of Mazzaleone's suspense had the town gone mad. Everywhere I saw change, even as great as in my cousin Gemma, a meek and pious girl. A long-eyed girl she was, downcast, too timid to look at one straight, given to shy, sidelong glances, a slim, honey-colored girl. I liked to tease her, to see the soft pink mount in her bashful cheeks. Now, as I passed by her house, I saw her at the window, herself but changed, soft yet, like a hazy sky in summer, but beckoning, inviting, and glancing now at Guido and now at young Leon Cavello, playing them more skillfully with her white and desirable innocence than any courtesan, while my aunt watched the game. As I told these things to Mazzaleone, I felt as ashamed as one who sees his mother indecorous in some public place. Give them life, said he, they snap at it and gulp it down like a hungry dog, and since they wish amusement, they shall have what they wish. Everything they wish they shall have. I could envy them their gusto, he added. And so he set about giving a festa of great magnificence, and asked all the nobles within the town of San Moglio, and he judged them rightly, for even the nobles, in their zest for life, had no mind to show spite to Mazzaleone. For the common people there was dancing in the street, and wine and music for all who wished, and so it was that the whole town fell into its great, lustful rejoicing that they were to live. End of chapter 3 Chapter Four of the Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, and I will wager that in all its life San Moglio had never seen gathered in the palace of the Podesta such a company, for there faction met faction as friends, old hate smiled at old hate, sworn enemies met for the first time without the drawing of swords nor could Mazzaleone's own eyes distinguish where a feud lay. One would have supposed that each felt a dear joy in thus seeing close at hand his own enemy. I saw Beatrice Degliodi talking with her brothers, though all San Moglio knew that they had sworn to tear her in pieces when that happy hour came that they might lay their hands upon her. And she talked with them as though they had never been parted as though they had not sworn her death so bitterly that she had not left the palace of Ugo de Sala since he took her there from her father's house, de Sala's men killing her kinsmen as he lifted her over the threshold. 
I stood near Count Bartolomeo, and heard him say to my lady, There is the making of a rare fight below. For in the courtyard, where the vassals of the rival houses met face to face, there was no smooth talking, and a menacing growl arose from it through the corridors and up the hallways. I had seen the retainers of Malatesta da Mogliano glomering at those of Casamato, and the men of Cola Degliodi itch for the throats of those of De Sala. The halberdiers of Mazzaleone formed an iron bar behind which the men could only show their teeth at one another. As my lord spoke, his dearest enemy, Carlo Graziani, passed, and he and my lord saluted each other, Graziani with the gravity of his disgruntlement. In times of peace a month was barren when there were no broken skulls given and taken between our house and that of Graziani, nor had these men met in many years, save when the common cause of San Moglio called them together. I could see a flame of interest in my lord's face, for it seemed to pique his bold humor. Then all at once his face darkened, and my gaze followed his, and fell on my lady talking with Mazzaleone. They conversed together as old friends. At this sight the heads of the company bent toward them like grain in the wind, for my lady was not of San Moglio. A peace offering of Barga to us, the living symbol of Barga's good faith, she had come here a young bride, a lovely white thing, silent and proud, and as Count Bartolomeo had warmed her in the fire of his love, she had warmed toward San Moglio. None of our household knew what had changed her from fire to ice toward him, but changed she was, and the city knew it, and since then it seemed that her heart was ever tugging and straining up toward Barghese Heights. And who knew what her friendship with Mazzaleone might portend for San Moglio? She walked slowly around the assembly, flashing her laughter here and there, at her ease with Mazzaleone. Before Count Bartolomeo she paused, and I of many heard her say, I knew him when I was but a little maid, in my father's house, he was there with a broken wrist. I called him the lean man Ahidio, and knew no other name. And Bartolomeo joined them in their walk, he also at his ease and smiling. And then there happened a strange thing. It was as if this sight had been some unseen torch, and had set to flaming the smouldering hates and feuds, the smothered hatreds of years. And now, without a word being spoken, without the outward suavity of the scene being changed, this fire crackled round through the assembly, as fire might catch a light festooning of drapery. With hatred came revenge. The thought of the black ballot and its use stalked exultant through us. Enforced peace was upon us, and with enforced peace a handy, silent weapon had Mazzaleone given to San Moglio. Down in the courtyard the men of San Moglio became more restless, and the men of Mazzaleone more alert, and as I went through to bid our torch-bearers be ready, I saw one of the men of Casamato fling forth his arm, and in his hand was a black ballot. This, cried he, for Count Malatesta and his house. End of chapter 4《Five of the Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. As he spoke, there came up from the town the roar of a brawling mob. Some were killed that night. All night the sound came to me. The men of Mazzaleone herded home the fighting factions as day broke. By the next day, the fire of revenge I had seen start in a ballroom had spread itself through the smallest quarters of the town. Each man saw how he might be revenged upon his enemy. There were few in Moglio who might not profit by the death of some one. Changed was the temper of the town. They had been wallowing in life. Now from one day to another they were wallowing in the thought of death. I met I questioningly, for each man hugged to his bosom the thought of old scores long due. In this temper they continued their rejoicing, and that pallid spectre, assassination, rejoiced with them. 
and with assassination and revenge smirked along the love of gain, asking, If you must kill your man, why not kill him whose death will be most to your advantage? And in this day and the days which followed, I had heard enough of such rumors to sicken me, until revenge for injuries to wipe off old hate seemed to me a clean passion. Then whisperings in corners began, while the braggadocio fellows openly showed their black ballots and talked of what they would do with them. The people became quiet, but there was a tenseness in the whole town, like the drawing of a bow across strings taut to the breaking point. As the fury of a crowd is worse than the fury of one man, so much more was San Moglio terrible, the whole of it a quiver with its desirous revenge, men and women locking within themselves some secret hate, until the sum of their hates made a whole so dark and sinister that it seemed to me my fair city had become a hell, and I cried out to Mazzaleone, What have you done to us? I only set the men's feet keeping step to the time of death, said he, the tramping of many feet to one rhythm, or the beating of many hearts to one love or one hate, is more terrible or more beautiful than any other thing, Matteo. End of chapter 5「The Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6. Pondering upon the changed face of the town, and upon its altered and so sinister temper, I walked slowly through the great hall. What I saw there was nothing, and yet it struck a chill as of death through me. My lady sat by the window with the sun shining square upon her loveliness and upon the gold of her hair, but she was sunk in so deep thought that she was unconscious of all around, as unconscious as one who sleeps. As though she knew not what she did, she played with a black ebony ballot as though it had been a jewel. Her eyes did not leave it, but watched it as it passed from one hand to the other, as it fell from her hand to the palm outstretched to receive it. Across the room sat my master, Count Bartolomeo Conti, and fastened upon her a look of inconceivable malignity. He also watched the ballot, and he knew and I knew that my lady was not conscious of him, nor of me, nor of space, nor of aught in all the world, but that she held death in her hand, and she was well pleased that she held death in her hand. I had come into the hall with sedate and slow step, thinking to find no one there, and slowly I traversed its long length, but while I was in that room scarcely did my breath come to me. It seemed to me that in crossing that silent room I lived more than the span of years that I had reached, and I pushed through the heavy door, and although I walked so slowly, as though absorbed in my own thoughts, panic was at my heels. I wanted to run from this sight, my master standing there in the insolent pride of his strength, watching my lady, who played so lovingly with the thought of death that she forgot life. As I got through the door it was as though I ran into the arms of my own chattering fright. In the corridor without was Father Giorgio. "'Have you seen, Matteo? Have you seen?' he cried at me. His fat cheeks were limp and grey, and it was the first time I had seen he was old. "'Oh, my poor Bartolomeo!' he cried. "'My poor lady!' Have you suffered as much as that? But this can't be, this can't be!" And he shoved out his two fat hands in front of him, as if shoving something away from him, and then, half talking to himself and half to me, was it not enough that I should see the soul of her frozen in a night, and see the softness of her wither? And must I, too, see this? My poor Bartolomeo! A hard man he is, and a strong man, but before God I swear he is not bad. It was to him only as if he had killed a whining dog. The Black Knight's work it was, the Black Knight's sowing, but not this harvest. You see, Matteo, she must not do this. In the hardness of my youth there was that in his complete discomposure that disgusted me. 
I plucked him by the sleeve and said to him, in a tone of authority unbecoming in me to use to a priest of God, Come, father, who can tell who listens here? I led him down the long, deep flights of stairs and along the corridors to his own room, wondering into what hell I had now stepped, and frightened that life in my own house, where I served those whom I loved, should turn so ghastly a face upon me. I had often talked in the garden with Simonetta, my lady's tiring girl, concerning my lord and my lady. We knew that my lady gave to my lord a cold, unvarying, grave courtesy. We called her among ourselves the most arrogant lady in the land, for we had both seen that she had the highest of arrogance, that which gives to all and asks from none. Pity she gave, and love and tenderness and kindness, to all who needed it. She asked nothing in return, and held herself as one who needs nothing. Yet we, who lived so close to her, suspected her of a soft, tender heart, needing all those things and receiving none of them. We remembered, too, a time when she gave more to my lord than courtesy, and when he gave less than the jealous love which he now gave her for he could not let her be, coming near her as though to bruise himself against her calm, as though he would hold her soul as close in his hand as he did her body, and with a fury that this forever escaped him. We knew that her gaiety dropped like a flag of mourning when he came near her, and it was this flame of life that burned so heavily within her that made her beloved by all, this and her joy in play, for she played as eagerly as children play, sometimes with a child's serious eyes, and sometimes with a child's laughter. When her gaiety was at its height, she seemed like some wild thing, and those who beheld it must needs run after it. It was like a flashing in scarlet thing. None of this, nor tenderness, was for my lord. This change, so Simonetta said, had come from one day to another. All these things came tumbling through my mind as I traversed the corridors with Father Giorgio, he shaking as with the ague. As he got in his room, he turned to me and said, She has drunken too deeply of the loathing horror of life. This loathing has shaped her into a frightful, tortured thing, and there is no forgetting for her. I know the very night when the flesh of her became so degraded in her sight that she would have rejoiced in a purifying fire that mercifully would have burned it from her. But he did what he did in anger. He stopped, and then as though he must tell, to relieve his mind of some intolerable burden, said, There was a girl here once, some poor and distant relation of Count Bartolomeo's. You knew her. I nodded. She had been a soft thing, too soft for my taste, with brown eyes like a dog's and one day she went away, and came back no more, and there had been some gossip, and that was all. Some months after the girl had gone, I sat one night in my room, said he, and with me Bartolomeo. I heard a whimpering as of a scared animal, and the curtain was held aside, and there stood my lady, and she pushed the girl in ahead of her. The girl was huddled under a cloak. "'And what do you here?' he cried. "'And what do you want?' "'You, my lord,' said my lady, looking at him straight, and the girl bowed her head. The black fury of the Contes, which kills what comes in their way, came over him. "'I told you to be gone,' said he, "'and to trouble me no more. Have you come whimpering back to show your shame?' "'Your shame and hers, my lord,' said my lady. "'Where will you have her hide her shame?' where it will trouble her no more, cried my lord through his blackness, and he pointed to that doorway. I looked where Father Giorgio pointed, and shivered, for our town is built on a hill, scrambling to its summit no one knows how. A mountain stream cleaves the town in two, cold as ice in midsummer. The garden of the Contes sits with its feet in the water, while that door leads to a narrow corridor, and the corridor to a bridge, and thence is a narrow stretch to the town. Far below the bridge runs the silent stream, and many have gone through that door who have never returned. "'You come to me for counsel,' he cried, "'and to know where to hide your shame. 
now hide it deep and hide it fast and he spoke in a tone that no man can resist he opened the door and bowed low my lady stepped up to him and my lord she cried my lord he swept her away as though she were paper pass madonna said he and the girl with the cloak around her bigness passed out before him and stood at the door shivering then he said there are less pleasant ways of dying pass she went out into the darkness whispering and he mocked her as she went and whimpered after her and closed the door and my lady said you have rendered a great service in that you have made my greatest grief my greatest joy my lord and what is this joy he asked that i had no son my lord in times of darkness i can remember that and my heart can become glad that i am childless you are young said he and i am still your loving husband the hour is very late let me conduct you to your room so he went with her then father giorgio dropped into a chair and covered his face with his hands i loved him he said i raised him from a little boy and she has made my heart to break with pity and she has death in her hands end of chapter six the ninth man by mary heaton vorse this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven i felt that i must leave the house it was noon san moglio sat at meat but i had stomach for neither meat nor drink this day i walked up the hill and sought solitude in a little frequented place hardly larger than a handkerchief at san moglio's summit in the shadow of a church portico sat brother agnello and he threw crumbs to the birds my heart was gladdened that there were those who could feed birds in the sunshine i sat myself beside him and a little blond child came up and leaned herself against his knees and reached up shyly for a bit of bread and some other children joined us some shyly some boldly when all the bread was gone but the last bit the boldest two quarrelled for it and one snatched it at which the other wept and said i shall tell my big brother what you have done to me and he will kill you with his black ballot ah but my father said the other will kill him first for he too has a black ballot nanetta has one also piped one of the little children and who will nanetta kill and here walking with importance came another child and three smaller children following her at a distance and those about the knees of brother agnello called out and who will you kill nanetta then she says with the manners of an heiress that is not yet decided my aunts and mother talk about it all the long day as do my father and his brothers and no two of them agree her pockets were full of sweet cakes and these she distributed but a big quiet boy who had borne himself like a man among his inferiors spoke up and said nanetta gives herself airs but there are other children who have the ballot and he pressed his lips together as one who would say no more he himself has it cried a child and he pointed a chubby finger at his brother julio himself has it i saw him as he thought i slept bring it from between his mattress and look at it at this they crowded about julio and what will you do with it julio and what doth thy father say hist said he my father does not know nor my mother i shall kill my master with it and then i shall be free moreover those children who now use their ballots as their fathers and mothers say are fools for they must undoubtedly some day work and be bound over as apprentices and they had better kill their masters there being no more bread and the noon hour being past the children ran away all but the little blonde girl who had remained pressed close to brother agnello's side and now when they were all gone she lifted the skirt of her pinafore and groped in her pocket bringing from it a ballot which she mutely showed to him and he feeling in his scrip brought out its fellow and the two smiled at each other like children who compare their marbles 
no one knows she whispered she lives with her grandmother brother agnello then said to me and the old dame is deaf and blind and the little maid too shy to talk to any and what will you do with yours he asked her gently she shook her head i know not and you with yours she made bold to answer with mine i shall kill myself said he in his simple way so no blood shall be upon my head then i too then i too she said clapping her hands i too will kill myself like you agnello at this he was troubled then he said why no i am as one already dead so you do cast your ballot for me and you shall live and not more be killed besides so you shall be innocent with that a light as from heaven streamed over his face and the little maid clapped her hands crying that i will do that i will do and glad enough that she need not kill herself but he did not hear her and i went away leaving him as one who listens to the voice of god's angels speaking end of chapter seven of the ninth man by mary heaton vorse this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight for a time it seemed as though the lust for revenge held sway in san moglio none thought of aught but killing from our beautiful and arrogant lady who sat brooding while she held death in her hand to the very children who prattled in the street concerning whom they would kill then came the thought of being killed it came silently like a frost in early summer death was still the thought of san moglio but each man now feared his own the red desire of killing and of revenge turned pale and by each man's hearthstone sat a cold little shadow of fear i thanked god i had made no man my enemy there were those who had tried to leave the city but had been turned back with stern menace by mazzaleone's men and we knew that those who were caught in attempted flight would be incontinently killed. The fear that sat with us gave bravery to some timid ones, and these the men caught, and such pieces of their bodies as were left when the soldiers were through with them were burned in the public place. Under the stress of fear many an odd marriage took place. It was said that to save her father's life, young concetta de moreale was married to bernabo de montemarte instead of to donati her betrothed and that the donati had sworn vengeance on bernabo who laughed and said he had not long to live anyway and he and his would take life for life many an old debt was paid enemies of long standing embraced and swore friendship each fearing the other since no one knew in whose hands death lurked simon the old usurer who lived next me and had a face like a scholar and talons like a hawk received threatening letters every day demanding of him that he should remit this and that debt and his wife almost as great a miser as himself would come daily to my mother and weep telling how that as yet he had not remitted one stiver I had heard that my cousin Gemma was seen of an evening coming out from the back gate of the Mancini's garden, and stung with shame, for all knew young Mancini, his beauty and his profligacy, I waited for her homecoming, and says I, What now, cousin? And she looks up at me with a wan smile. Dying, I please myself, cousin. Dying? says I, gaping at her. Ay, says she for my two gallants love me so well that each would kill me for the other's spite, and now they have so much for which to kill me, and I have had my heart's desire. So whether in my mother's house or the palace of the Conti, death brooded. But his darkness was blackest at the palace. Mazzaleone's long shadow was ever at our door, and the whole town gaped at the trio of them. My lady, rosy as with love, between Mazzaleone, lean and pale as a drawn sword, and Count Bartolomeo, red and powerful in his lusty joy of life. 
the town talked openly that my lady would kill bartolomeo and that then mazzaleone would find a bride but none doubted that bartolomeo's heavy fist would fall first so the shadow of death distorted the faces of all dear to me on my dear ladies it cast a softness and joy more terrible than aught else she grew young in the presence of mazzaleone and when she sat alone she seemed as one who hugs a sweet secret it was in that day that i shook with an ague of disgust for life and i wished aloud in my ignorance that death would menace me as well and then as if in answer to my wish there came to me in my room simonetta my little friend of whom i had less thought of sweethearting than had she been my sister she had been crying but now her eyes were clear as i looked at her she cried oh mateo i have had to come to you before you die i want to tell you that i love you i have always loved you mateo had not dismay given me thought i could have seen how vain were my boasts of a love of death whenever did a young and lovely sweetheart come less desired to any man i had not sense enough left to play the gallant death i cried and why death simonetta oh she answered wringing her hands it is the shoemaker's lame son oreste he hates you mateo a weight was lifted from me i hardly knew the lad well i remembered him sitting all day before the cobbler's door and sometimes dragging his legs painfully behind him like a lame dog so why should he hate me so i fell to comforting simonetta and found the comforting of her sweet but the thought of the shoemaker's son stayed with me and tormented me in my sleep and in the early morning i made my way to the shop and he sat in his little chair grinning horribly he said ha you have come they brought thee word mateo now it is my turn to love life for it is better to have crooked legs and live ones than straight legs and dead ones be proud of your straight legs while you may mateo and he spoke to me with such spite and such venom that it distorted the face of him and what have i done to thee oreste i cried when i was little and would have played with you you ran away and what have you done to me says he morning and night you have passed me by a living reminder of what i was and what you were morning and night you have made my lot bitterer to me for all the things that i had not you had but now i shall soon have that which you have not morning and night when you are wont to pass by here there will be a happy and rejoiceful time for me instead of one of shame and envy so astounded was i i had no word for him for i had never thought of him i remembered indeed that when i was a lad i had plagued him thoughtless as had the other lads but i never hurt you oreste i faltered and he mocked me the serene lord has forgotten that he took from me the only sweet thing i ever had when we were lads mateo i had a little sweetheart when the others ran away and would not play with me she sat with me when they mocked me she comforted me then you came one day and taught her to play with you and to laugh at me like the others since that day i have known the worth of pity and have taken none of it thus he drowned me with the pent-up venom of years and i had gone to him assured that morning and having found that I had a sweetheart instead of a friend in Simonetta, and feeling no little pride in myself, therefore, I now slunk away, having received a death sentence from a mad and relentless judge. I went to my own home, and I had hardly got within the doors when Simon the usurer's wife came crying and shrieking to us. My mother and I ran with her, not making head nor tail of her lamentations she kept repeating over and over he was so afraid of death he has killed himself we thought her gone daft until in the courtyard gate we came upon simon himself swinging where he had hanged himself and he swung to and fro gently in the morning breeze a wagging pendulum of fear 
I was now no more a young philosopher with the keen eyes of Mazzaleone. No longer did I move upon the outside, marvelling over the turpitude of men. Now I knew why Gemma had sought her secret and shameful love, and why my lady sat with her black ballad in her hand, and why Simon the usurer had killed himself, for there were times when panic was in my breast, and felt I had best stick my own knife in my breast, and not wait for who knows what death at the hands of Mazzaleone. I knew why men and women sat silent and brooding, for I sat that way also. I pondered this and that means that I might find of ridding myself of the cobbler's son. So I, together with the rest of San Moglio, brooded with fear in the thoughts of death and the thoughts of murder. And the cobbler's son read my thoughts, for he stayed well within doors and grinned at me as I passed. For comfort I sought Brother Agnello, and found him preaching to some gaping women at a street corner, telling them that through the mouths of children it had been revealed to him that it was God's will that he should take the blood of San Moglio on him. But his words were to me like the babbling of a madman, for I sat now in the dolorous heart of San Moglio, and I knew that its heart was full of hate. The sight of him became bitter to me, and it seemed to me I encountered him always when I went abroad, and the blonde child with him. Now the children tormented him, now men stopped and listened to him for a moment and passed on laughing. A few old women listened to him, but for the most part he walked unnoticed up and down the streets, or was mocked as a fool. My lady saw him from her window, thus talking at a street corner. "'What does the brother minor, Matteo?' says she. For some time past she had been light of heart, almost had she the gay innocence of a child. It seemed that the aching wound of her spirit had found some ease. "'He preaches,' I made reply, "'that all in San Moglio shall cease from hating and killing, and shall love each other.' I spoke bitterly. He begs them to place their ballots of death upon him, as he is already as one dead, and he has for disciple this blonde child with him. At this she sighs. Poor gentle brother, says she, poor gentle flicker of mercy and pity. End of chapter 8《9 of the Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Now, together with many others, I turned myself to the church, to try there to find some comfort. And on the next Sunday, I and all our household were at Mass, and in his insolence, Count Bartolomeo had asked Mazzaleone to attend with us. For, like a man who cannot leave a wound alone, but must forever be picking at it, he seemed to find a perverse pleasure in throwing my lady and our town's conqueror together and watching the joy she had with him. Shy she was with Mazzaleone, and sweetly bold also, as though she had gone back to the days of her little childhood when she had played with the lean man, Ejidio. Small comfort was mass to me this day, and small comfort was preaching afterward, for there was in it the fear of hell, as though it were not already burned into the heart of each one of us. "'One ninth of you are to die,' was echoed to us like a tolling bell, more sure than the pestilence, more sure than war. One ninth of this wicked city was to die, was the comfort that the priest gave us. It was as though death brooded in a dark cloud over that still and frightened congregation. We were to die, and some of us knew at whose hands, and some did not, and few there were who did not fear the stab in the dark. In that cathedral we all drank deep of the black draught of terror, and the fear in one man's eyes found a mirror in the fear in every other man's, until I believed that as we went out into the sunlight many and many a one was not far from the fear that killed Simon, that intolerable fear of death which prefers death to the fear of death. I know that I should have liked to run from the accursed place, for so was the cathedral to me, and the preaching brother, instead of being a priest of God, 
seemed to be a priest of terror itself. As we walked out in the sunlight, we saw coming across the piazza a strange procession. At the head was Brother Agnello, and the little maid who now no longer quitted him. There was a witless girl following him, with her baby in her arms. And there, strangely enough, was Tommaso, an armorer, a man of some substance, and accredited of hard, good sense. And behind him, a tall, gangling youth of good family, but much shunned by his mates as a senseless sort of dreamer, one Ercole de Fabriano. And this assembly was completed by a little hobbling company of age and misery. Thus they faltered across the piazza, a thin, wavering band of pity. My lady, whose gladness had suffered in the cathedral, as must needs any one in that terrible place of terror, said to Mazzaleone, This is the brother minor of whom I told you, who wishes to take our sins upon himself. Mazzaleone beckoned to him, and his men held back the crowd as brother Agnello approached. Tell the people what you wish, says Mazzaleone to him in that gentle voice of his that one hears from so far. Then says Tommaso with heat, He sees no sense in your useless slaughter, nor do I, and takes that slaughter on himself, and I as a sensible man am with him. And are you the only man of sense, asked Mazzaleone, in all San Moglio? And one would have sworn his voice was sad. Now speak, says he, Thus was the coal of speech laid upon the lips of Brother Agnello. So there he faced that congregation who, under the ban of death, streamed forth from the cathedral and from hearing the word of God preached to them, and they were held back by Mazzaleone's men. "'Oh, my brothers!' cried he. "'Oh, my brothers! Slay not one another, but cast your ballots for me, unworthy, and deliver yourselves from sin and the pain of death, for I am as one dead. What he said more I could not hear, for a murmur went through the company. Then they barked their laughter at him like hungry wolves. Mazzaleone raised his hand, and the men set down their pikes which had formed a bar, and the congregation swarmed forth, each man carrying with him his burden of fear and hate, and the little company of mercy was swallowed up. Says Mazzaleone, it is easy to lead a company to victory with the voice alone, but it is only with a sword one may stop the rout of panic or an army when it loots a town. End of chapter 9《The Ninth Man》by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 as I have shown, each man within our gates brooded on death, but there were larger doings afoot than such small killings as glut one man's hate or satisfy one man's desire of profit. Higher hates than these there were, and greater discomforts than an older brother sitting in the place that a younger coveted, greater riches to be snatched than that of a relative too slow in dying. The Degli Odi and the house of Da Sala had long striven for power one with another, and at varying times had split the city in two, and the old rivalry had been given an edge of hate through the marriage of Beatrice degli Odi to Ugo da Sala, and now they carried on a novel warfare. The rival houses dreamed wholesale assassination for their own ends. There began through the town a buying up of the black vote of death, this I knew because the Conti supported the house of da Sala, and day by day they met to discuss and to count their gains, and whisper among themselves of the activity of their enemy, and though the vote was to be given secretly, they devised means by which they might keep an eye upon their own men, whom they had bought, and mete out punishment to them later, or beforehand fill them so full of the fear of some less easy death, that they might be sure of their word." Thus they trafficked for men's lives in men's greed. And I, as scribe, kept the lists. Much talk there was among them as to what black hatred could have possessed the soul of the cobbler's lame son, that his ballot could not be bought from him, 
for ever he made the same answer to count bartolomeo's steward when asked his price sound legs says he nothing less and laughs at himself one day ugo da sala asks are all accounted for in your household all but the ballot of my lady count bartolomeo makes reply ah said count ugo da sala i did not know of hers and her disposition of it i have my private use for it replies my lady and her voice sounded light of heart and at this my hand tightened on the arms of my chair meantime the mind of our podesta messer grubio di grollo had further imaginings and he called together a great conclave of all the principal men and nobles and in this assembly sat also mazzaleone and his captains he was a spare man messer gubbio with the long face of a horse and wind when he talked as long as his face but for all that a just man and a man of force he made a long speech which went to the effect that too long had fear and hatred rioted among us since one ninth of the town were to die we should turn this fact to our advantage as a wise man might turn any event in life however grievous so says he let us all sacrifice to the common good our factional hates and our personal revenge as a vigorous tree acquires vigor by pruning let us prune the town of san moglio and let us see that the ninth that are to die shall be those who are not beneficial to a strong state the weaklings the feeble-minded the paupers and such few as are bitten with the madness of a too overweening ambition as he spoke i saw that a great mirth had been lighted in mazzaleone and that the so reasonable speech of messer gubbio filled him with silent laughter messer gubbio went on to counting out each contrada of the city that lists might be made of those who have the ballot and how each great house and each man of importance in each contrada should possess himself of the people's confidence but says some one what then of the ballots of the poor and the maimed and the unworthy and the weaklings themselves whose pruning shall help our town what of their ballots shall weak kill weak oh says messer gubbio those will be easily bought up for gain and all in the company nodded and bowed together as gravely and discussed as gravely as the podesta himself only ludovico de casamato a stern old noble sprang to his feet and says he away with your slaughter of your townsmen my blood be on my own head and young giuliano di donati a wild youth but one of great bravery and pride and mine as well and mine cries another a cadet of the morale and messer gubbio sirs sirs are not your lives of more value than those of a witless girl or a blind beggar consider then cries out the angry old lord ludovico i have considered for the hour past until the blood of innocents and the unfortunates is swilling about my ankles now a dispute arose high on this side and that many for the plan and some against it as for mazzaleone he took his own terrible and silent joy in the spectacle as one who bathes upon a hot day so did he bathe in the ebb and flow of the passions of men and in the midst of this dispute there came the shrill noise of the singing of children and from the back of the hall came down the brother minor agnello and the blonde child beside him and following his band to which had been added a woman or two and some youths and maidens and the wavering voices of the old men and the shrill piping of the children cut through the talk as a tiny ray of light the black darkness of night silence followed in their wake and all stared at them in amazement then says brother agnello in his deep voice like a sweet bell in the name of christ my master messer gubbio what do you wish says the podesta the gift of five minutes says he and smiles upon us some there were who cried cast him forth and others let him speak old ludovico casamato cried out in his hot angry voice let him speak say i for he asks in the name of christ 
and I have heard enough talk in the name of the devil these days past. He stood before them, his hand on the shoulder of the little maid, as though he were bathed in a pool of light, as though love itself shone from his eyes. O oh, men of San Moglio, he cried out, I am sent here that I, who am one already dead, may take away from you your fear. Cast upon me the bond of death, for who are you that you shall judge in this town what ninth are worthy to live and which must die? For who may judge such things but God? As the first day I had met him, he had taken from my lady and myself our apprehension and left us with peace, so it seemed now that peace streamed from him in a great flood. Then said Ludovico de Casamato, Here, brother, take mine men, and I will go with you. Who follows me? And many there were who joined him, and a hush fell upon all. Agnello stood a while and embraced them in the silence of his regard, and then he walked out in silence from among them into the waiting crowd of poor people and of halt and lame who had heard of the beneficent design of Messer Gubbio, and had come to learn their fate. When Brother Agnello appeared, and after him the little company of nobles, there arose a cry from all the stricken of San Moglio, and there were there the sons of women stricken with palsy, and the children of blind fathers, and there were there the children of the poor, and they took Agnello up in their arms and bore him along and the noise of their shouts was the first glad thing we had heard since the fear of death had been over us. End of chapter 10 End of The Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 they bore him along triumphant on their shoulders, scaling the steep streets of San Moglio, and behind him hobbled the maimed and the very poor and the very old, and the mothers of feeble children, and all those innocents upon whom great fear had been cast by the wise plan of Gubbio di Grollo. And there came not a few of the nobles and the first men of San Moglio, some sick with the thought of killing, and others drawn by curiosity. They bore him up to the little piazza Ogni Santi, and he went out on a balcony above a doorway, and all of the misery of San Moglio was packed into this piazza, and the nobles were jostled among them, and far down the streets came others, until every street that led away was packed with the people of San Moglio. They cried out to him, Are we saved? Tell us, Agnolo, are we saved? He waited until it was quiet through all the place, and then said he, And who could harm you? For upon me be your blood, for it was for this that I was born. And the words that he spoke, that had once seemed to me the ravings of a madman, now seemed as though they were spoken by the voice of God. I felt, when I heard him speak, as if I had been dying of thirst, and he gave me to drink. I had forgotten what hope was, and love, and lo, here were both and thus he delivered me, as he did all those wretched ones before him, who had had to suffer not only the pains of poverty and of their feeble bodies, but also, under the wise plan of Messer Gubbio, the fear of death. Brother Agnello called forth from all of us those fair things, love and hope, and he linked us together into a mighty army of love, and not one of us who heard him could have lifted his hand to kill his fellow man hate was gone from among us. The San Moglio that I had seen turning to me the face of one who lives in hell was now full of the rejoicing of heaven, and we who heard him speak believed that for this end was Brother Agnello born. Mighty and terrible is the tramping of an angry crowd, and red with lust a city drunk with the love of life, and worse a city that plays with the thought of death and rejoices at revenge, and terrible a city whose face is grey with fear. It seems as if no force there be on earth great enough to overcome such things. And lo, the voice of one man, unfriended, unhelped, with no other weapon but the love in his heart, had been stronger than all other things. 
i joined the crowd that went rejoicing to their homes transformed from the children of fear and hate to the children of love and pity but as i went past the cobbler's shop the cobbler's lame son sat and grinned his hate at me and as i went into the great hall mazzaleone and my lady sat talking in low tones by the window and she turned away a blushing cheek as though she were his sweetheart and bartolomeo in his lustful pride stood apart and talked with other ladies yet his eyes rested for ever on the two by the window End of chapter 1112 of the ninth man by mary heaton vorse this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 12 as i saw these sights i saw that we were still fast in the mire of hate but i had seen the hearts of a multitude beating in tune to love yes i had seen hate turned into love late that day mazzaleone as was his custom had me tell him the things which i had seen in the city and of what had happened to brother agnello and as i told him my heart beat high for it was as though i had seen a miracle of god that day and so you matteo says he smiling his wry smile believe that this lay preacher has been sent to take the sins of san moglio on him and to keep the people from glutting their hates sir said i none could hear him without that belief he looked at me and there was a sort of pity in his gaze men says he are evil in their ways lustful and vengeful matteo and in this town there is many a deep-rooted hate and many an old revenge that has dragged out its long span of years in these days you and i matteo have seen hate blossom and flower and in fair gardens we have seen revenge put forth its dark and powerful roots can the few soft words of a preaching boy uproot such revenge as you and i have seen to god in his mercy all things are possible i replied amen he answers but where do you look here for god has he busied himself in softening the heart of the de sala for the degliodi is there no peace for that old hate this side of death and i know others more relentless than this i have put a sure and sharp weapon in their hands and the sight of it has made them all come yapping for blood what does he offer them this poor brother agnello poor brother lamb that shall so slake their ancient thirst for blood thirst for blood matteo is sated by one thing red blood sates it are Messer gubbio di grollo and his friends moved with pity think you as they sit even now seeing what men they may summon to do their merciful work and what men had he whose hearts chanted love and forgiveness they were the poor said i and women and some nobles too i said stoutly how much pity would they have do you think if they were offered riches as they may be any one of them by to-morrow they are the weak and the poor who form your army of pity a little band that to-day sings hallelujah to god and to-morrow will sell his brother's life for less than twenty pieces of copper where your town breeds one ludovico casamato it spawns twenty of the breed of sala a knowledge of the hearts of men has been my business these many years hark said i for far off they were singing and this time the piping children were drowned by full-voiced singing of men as a great procession moved along the street joy and light walked with them gladly would i have joined them there are many who are not there said mazzaleone in his low flickering voice i do not see the cobbler's lame son then he says after a pause and what night shall my men slit his throat for you matteo i looked at him without answering and did you think says he that i would let him wreak his spite upon my friend it would be a great pity to have so merry a tongue silenced for the whim of a spiteful cripple i will send my men when you wish this very night perhaps for his malicious face does not please me as i go to and fro what say you matteo i say i cannot my lord i answered in a low voice it was as though some one else spoke within me 
for god knows life would have been sweet to me without that jeering face that had taught me to know the black heart of san moglio that evening like a fool i told simonetta and she wept in my arms crying that i did not love her i would kill him said she i would stamp on him as i would crush a spider and there came back to me mazzaleone's words and were you to find mercy in the hearts of all men mateo yet would you not have softened the merciless hearts of loving women i hungered for the peace and rest that death of the cobbler's son would give me and doing so perceived that the whole city of san moglio was a battlefield as was my own heart that each soul which had the power of life and death must fight thus dolorously even as i did i felt my own weakness and the words that mazzaleone had spoken without love and without hate from the depths of his knowledge of the hearts of men echoed themselves in me as he had said he had set men's feet keeping step to the tune of death and brother agnello had cried to us above this march of death until all the heart of all san moglio was torn it is a strange thing to see a town having to fight life and death within itself the company of pity which never wavered were happy and those who sought death always were happier in their own way than those who wavered and swayed as must i many a man i saw and woman who were a thirst for blood as a hungry man for meat at one moment and at the next moment put from them all thought of revenge and all thought of death and then must go a-licking their chops again at the sweet thought of death when such battles fight themselves out in the silence of a man's soul it is bad enough for him but when he feels his fellows fighting it when the air is full of it and the town heavy with it when the sweet faces of girls show its conflicts and its desire to kill comes into the placid eyes of mothers of children then is one's own torment made tenfold when mazzaleone asked me and what do you think of it boy i replied to him in my agony i think sir that the taking of no city could have caused you more pleasure i have seen a gallant fight says he and a man lead a forlorn hope then let him win i cried am i fate or god said mazzaleone to meddle with this vast spectacle you do me too much credit i am only one who sits watching by the wayside without meddling so the battle raged in me as it did through the city streets and in the houses and palaces till the town was sick with its own doubts even among the houses of da sala and degliotti had the voice of brother agnello penetrated i had thought that this hate was made of harder stuff said mazzaleone to me love is a terrible force matteo so strong a solvent of the fierce and strong things of life that we should all beware of it few men have used it as a tool for the reason that love in its pureness is rarer than the rarest jewels but many have used hate i told him as you have done and what of us whose hearts must die on the battlefield of love and hate so for that whole week through the battle raged in me as it did through the city now i longed for the death of the cobbler's son and now the thought of having his throat slit in the dark sickened me when i saw brother agnello my soul was bathed in light and when i went into the shadowed house of the conti it was as though the soul of me was bathed in blood for andrea and malatesta the count's two brothers were often there holding long conversations with bartolomeo about what none doubted for in the pothouse and in the courtyards of the palaces and in the palaces themselves there was talk enough all knew that mazzaleone was with us as if there was his appointed place and so did our lady receive him one day simonetta heard andrea say to our count how now brother how long shall this shame persist and when shall i rid you of it wait said my lord count there is time enough there's never time enough said malatesta for a woman to make a plaything of the honour of our house who says that any has done this says count bartolomeo 
Shall I be coward enough to plunge all San Moglio in blood because of tattling tongues? He stood there before them, black and powerful, a man to love, Simonetta reported him, for his sure courage and for his insolence. Menace there might have been in him, but no weakness ever. Through this blackness my lady walked as though she saw nothing and heard nothing, until that I could have cried aloud to her to beware of Bartolomeo and his black brothers, until each night as she went to her bed I thought that I might never see her again. I knew that Bartolomeo was fighting the fight as to whether he should be killed or kill. I knew that he was looking around with that shrewd mind of his to see what road there was to keep my lady and his own life. The days dragged by slow as the coming of death, yet they ran, and each day Mazzaleone said to me, The days grow short, shall it be to-night? Each time I shook my head. So for a week all San Moglio fought. Now its men and women drew themselves together in a knot of venomous hate, and again, with hearts calm and hate dead in them, listened to Brother Agnello, and none might tell who would gain the victory until but two nights and one day were left us, and Simonetta did not cease to cry. Let the others listen to Brother Agnello, but be sure that the cobbler's son will not. So at last, for I loved life, he shall die, I told her. At that she kissed me and left me, and I felt I had betrayed my master, and that the triumph of love was far away, and I wept. End of chapter 12「Of the Ninth Man」by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 I had not much time for such womanish moments. Soon Simonetta returned to me, and there was fear in her face. "'It is Mazzaleone's bidding that you and I shall come to the foot of the garden,' said she. In our house that evening there was a great company assembled since those who live under such a shadow as we do not love solitude. When we gained the great hall, we stood aside while Mazzaleone was talking to this one or that one. Then he says to my lady, The night is warm. Shall we walk for a while in the garden? Together they walked forth into the night. After a moment, as we had been bidden, we followed them. Our garden marches down, terrace by terrace, to the river. A narrow slit it is, and full of solemn cypresses, and at this season full of oleander bloom. It seemed to me, as I walked past their ghostly flowers, that I had never heard so much rustling among the leaves. Unrest was in the air, and fear. I felt that there was some hidden menace about, and Simonetta shivered and slid her hand into mine. Then as we came to the foot of the garden, where the high wall keeps out the river, I saw that the wall was alive with Mazzaleone's men-at-arms, and that behind each cypress stood one of the men of the Conti. For a moment my lady stood alone by herself, while it seemed that the knight waited, panting. The moonlight fell upon her, and I marveled that any woman could look as sweet as she, and so happy, when a sea of blood was lapping at her very feet. It seemed strange that anything with so innocent a look could live at the core of so much hate and so much conflicting desire. So for a second it seemed that this knight stood quiet to watch her, as did the men hiding in night's darkness. I knew that Mazzaleone's men waited, and that among the cypress trees waited the men of our house, all with their eyes upon her. Then from behind us came the whispering sound of the soft drawing of swords, and I heard the voice of Mazzaleone say, quick, toward the wall. And he stood before her, while Bartolomeo and Andrea and Malatesta leaped toward her. There was the sound of the men now unleashed, then her dear voice from the midst of them. Wait, my lords, it seems that here there is some mistake. And have you thought, Egidio, that my lord Bartolomeo has taught me to trust men so that I would go with you? It is true, says she, that I have been nursing to myself the thought of escape, 
and that you yourself, Ahidio, had given me it, and I thought of that escape in my own death, and for a while, as one dying may wish to drink of a cool cup of water, I have taken pleasure in the friend of my childhood. For I loved your strength, and I loved the subtlety of your wit, and they were the fairest things I had ever known. But in these latter days I have seen for the first time a strength that is beyond your strength, and a power that makes not of your subtlety. To this higher strength and power have I given my life, and now I say adieu to you, Ehidio, and to you, Bartolomeo, I say adieu. So alone she walked up the terraces one by one, and Mazzaleone's men vanished from the wall, and under each cypress tree our men stood silent. Halfway up the garden she turned to a little door which led over the bridge, and by the door stood two of those whom we afterward came to know as the poor ladies of Santa Clara, and she went with them. From the other side of the bridge there came to us the singing of Brother Agnello's Company of Mercy. Thus Mazzaleone and Bartolomeo suffered her to go, for they could have stopped her no more than death, and they could follow her as little as one may follow the soul when it flies from the body. And so they bowed their heads as before death. End of chapter 13《fourteen of the Ninth Man by Mary Heaton Vorse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen. I could not sleep, and before day broke, I went forth into the silent streets and mounted to the Piazza Ogni Santi as though in search of Brother Agnello, for my soul thirsted for the sight of him. Though it was yet dark, I found him kneeling there, and with him many of his company of mercy but he knelt apart, as one praying by himself, so I knelt there among the others. And in the dawning light I saw that tears streamed down his cheeks, and I wondered if he too doubted. At sunrise he went into the church of Ogni Santi, and confessed his sins, and prepared as for death, and came forth again, and again knelt. He walked as though he saw no one. But now there was a great peace upon his face, and thus all day he remained. All day he knelt and he spoke not one word, nor moved, but knelt there silently before God, and silence was upon the piazza where he was. The crowd that came and went unceasing moved as silently as those who carry the dead, and the silence of the piazza gained to the street, and from the street to the houses and the palaces. There was over San Moglio a hush as though the town held its breath in silent prayer. Yes, there was throughout that city the silence of those who pray beside the dead. In the palace of the Podesta sat Mosaleone, his head sunk in his hands, and saw no one. As noon struck, the silence of San Moglio was broken by the clanking of Mosaleone's men as they went forth into the great piazza, and there they built a scaffold for the morrow. The noise of their hammerings echoed through the silent town, through the hot hours of the afternoon, but none stopped to watch them, and few there were in the piazza, save those who came and went, walking as on some urgent business. For all knew that silent above the town in the piazza Ognisanti, Brother Agnello sat with God. The noise of the building of the scaffold lasted through the day, and dusk came, and yet went on the noise of building, until at last it stood there complete, a monstrous emblem of hate and the lust of revenge. Brother Agnello sat with God above the town, but as night came, hate came skulking forth. As the city had been quiet through the day, so it was restless through the night, for the scaffold and the darkness between them bred strange doubt in our hearts. Dark groups of people moved restless through the streets up to the Piazza Ogni Santi, and from there it seemed that they were sucked down to the great piazza against their will. Fear moved among them in the darkness of the night, and whispered its warnings into their ears. That quiet, restless ebb and flow of dark forms through dark streets gripped at my heart. 
i think it seemed to many as it did to me that brother agnello fought alone against the devils that had so long ruled our hearts as for me i fought no more i strove no more i was weary with the fight and with the other drifting shadows i drifted to the piazza ogni santi and back again to the scaffold and i cared nothing if tomorrow meant life or death so that it brought peace i surrendered my spirit to the brother minor and found myself praying as if to a saint save us if you can in that night i ceased to be myself and became a part of the sleepless suspense of that waking town which knew not if tomorrow would see the scaffold and altar or streaming with blood in the darkest hours i came on a lad i knew blubbering in a doorway and when i asked him why do you cry i'm afraid of the devils he whimpered the devils run through the streets mateo the devils run and i fear them stay with me mateo many there were who said afterward that there were dark shapes among us who were no men of san moglio dark shapes herding us back for ever and for ever to the scaffold in the piazza as the lad shook with fear i sat down beside him and as i comforted him a wan peace came over me and i sat there as san moglio whispered to itself unceasing while it waited sleepless for dawn as though all san moglio were but one person waiting to know if its soul were given to god or to the devil the lad slept a little on my shoulder and as the first grayness of dawn came he awoke and we went together to the great piazza and there on the scaffold we saw standing a dark figure i knew that this was brother agnello the piazza was full already of waiting people and of the restless sound of their muttering i heard those who talked of devils and others who had heard children singing as light came i saw that at the foot of the scaffold sat three of the poor ladies and one of them was my own lady and leaning against her was the little blonde child around about were many of brother agnello's disciples and many of the company of mercy and some were so weary that they slept with the growing light the crowd grew until the piazza was filled with the people of san moglio the gray of sleeplessness and fear and doubt was in their faces and they all looked up to brother agnello as though imploring peace from him then the sun came and i could see his face he looked on us with his gentle gaze and with such love as a mother who comforts her sick child and soothes it to rest so he stood for a long while and though he spoke no word i have never heard god's word so truly preached then beside me i heard a low sobbing as of a woman who mourns the death of a dear son the noise of her sobbing was a little noise but one that was born in the very heart of grief i heard a man's voice say do not grieve mother since it was for this that he was born i turned and saw the old woman who had first laughed her joy and revenge and comforting her was the cobbler's lame son many there were who wept and this low sound so filled our ears that when the trumpets blared forth and the heralds cried that those with the ballots should form in line their noise came to me as afar off as a sound without meaning as one in a dream i made my way through the crowd and joined the other scribes near mausoleone in the loggia he sat among his captains very grave and weary and i knew he too had kept san moglio's vigil not once did his eyes leave the brother minor he sat there as one who does honor to a power mightier than his own now all was silent no one moved no one spoke and then the silence was rent by the brazen voices of the trumpets and by the heralds crying that the balloting should begin at that moment and before any could cast a ballot brother agnello took a short sword from the soldier who stood beside him on the scaffold and cried out o oh god accept my life unworthy for the lives of these he drove the sword through his heart and thus he died then from all that great congregation of people went up a cry to heaven and all sank upon their knees while mazzaleone arose and said to me 
the ballots have been cast end of chapter 14 end of the ninth man a story by mary heaton vorse